welcome to RPV City Talk. I'm Liz Brown Swanson here with the mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes, Mayor Eric Alegria. It doesn't get any more beautiful than this. It's a gorgeous day in RPV. Perfect day in RPV. Well, I'm so excited. The mayor, we've been taking the show on the road. Once a month, you get together to give us an update of all the great things happening in our city. And it was your idea to really take the show to different communities where the council is dealing with issues, specifically right here. We are at the Del Cerro Park neighborhood. As you can see, we are at the entrance to the Portuguese Bend Reserve of the Palos Verdes Nature Preserve. And of course, the council um, and the residents here, we've been talking for years really about the issue of having the preserve right here and the impact of the neighborhood. And of course, Mayor, you have to balance public access to the preserve with the concerns of the impacts that take place with everybody wanting to be here. This is like, I think, LA's playground. So with that, welcome. And let's just start off with the latest city council action where you've been addressing issues and solutions to help with the, the issues here. Thank, thank you so much, Liz. <laughs> and I'm delighted to be here. And it's so rewarding to be here. And you said it perfectly. It's been years. And I know the outcry in the community around us here that the various HOAs has Kind of got into a fever pitch over recent months and years because of the impact of course the pandemic lots more visitors right. that are coming to our community to enjoy the beauties of uh, rpv and as a result we've spent now several months of this last year uh, looking at balanced solutions to to the uh, the issue here and certainly the two sort of major elements of the solution are our new shuttle which is starting in april which will go from the city hall property along PB Drive South at various public access points for people visiting the community as, a, as an incentive to get people to look at our other entry points, as well as many of the changes that we've made to the parking here, mm -hmm. right in front of us on uh, Crenshaw. Right, so we're sitting here at the end of Crenshaw, like we said, the entrance to um, the Portuguese Bend Reserve, which is really the busiest entrance. There's lots of places that you can come into our beautiful preserve, which is I think part of educating the community that even though this is a great place to come, there's lots of other spots to enjoy, which I think is part of the planning now um, as a strategy. You know, why not enter the, uh, go down through Alta Vicente mm -hmm. or over at Gateway off PB Drive South where the shuttle will stop, right? But as far as today, even they were out red striping. So you're changing here the model of where people can park, kind of give us a ballpark like about the public parking that will be here as well as the new parking app um, that's being rolled out by the city by May that you will reserve parking to come yes. here. Yes, so starting <laughs> shortly here in May, um, several weeks from now, uh, we will have Park Mobile, our new parking app, will be initiated and rolled out uh, and will affect uh, 58 of our spaces here, including uh, 18 of the spaces that currently sit in uh, the Park Place um, area okay. uh, adjacent to Del Cerro. And so we've made several changes and look forward to rolling that out. We think this is going to be a, a, a good way of balancing volumes of visitors and again, attracting people to those other points in the preserve. A lot of beauty and RPV to enjoy. So let's get folks to look at all aspects of the preserve, um, all 1400 acres of it, in of, fact. Of course. And I was, you know, earlier today as, as you know, hikers and bikers and walkers are coming through here, um, many of them were aware of all the changes that the council, how hard you've all been working to kind of figure out a strategy that it can be win-win for the, the neighbors here um, that want to kind of preserve their peace and quiet and tranquility and quality of life versus everybody that wants access. And they have to say they think you're doing an amazing job um, because it's, 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 it's not that it's complicated, but it's still complex because you're trying to make everybody happy and it, who, who can say no to coming out and enjoying nature, right? That's uh, wonderful so, to hear the positive feedback. We've, the council has listened very intently to the, the, the perspective of the neighbors. Um, and I'm very sympathetic. They've had a huge impact in this area for some time. Mm -hmm. It was certainly due time for us to figure out what works best for our community here. So what, what, what the community needs to know is number one, come May, you're gonna have a, probably a reservation system yes. that will be in place. It's a pilot program. You'll reserve up to a three hour block of time to park along what's called the south side of Crenshaw. Correct. Correct, which is close to the entrance to the preserve. Um, and there'll be about 40 spots there. And then another 18 or 16 total at the park place. Correct. Which up till now was permitted parking, permitted parking for residents, but that will be available to all people. Um, but again, it will be reservation. So. I think the best thing is to go log on to the city website too. Log on for to the, the city update, website. All the um, information is there. On the parking program and the shuttle program, the pilot should kick off in April with the shuttle starting That's correct. at City Hall. 
It's going to go from City Hall down to PVIC, um, where people can get off to enjoy the Interpretive Center. The shuttle will continue to drop off at Ab Cove, at Avalone mm -hmm. Cove, and then head down to my neighborhood in Seaview. <laughs> I found out the shuttle will be going right by my house. Not too far from me, too. Yes, yes, right, right <laughs> in our neighborhood, turning around. And then I think the big plus is dropping off um, people on the shuttle to Gateway Park, which is an amazing way to hike into the preserve. It's such a beautiful spot. I know that prior councils have been challenged with how do you safely get people in and out of right. there? We hope the shuttle provides some solution to that. Because there really isn't, there isn't par parking there at Gateway, but it's, there's a way to enter in. And it'll be interesting to see because of COVID, the amount of uh, people on the shuttle will be limited to about, I think, 12 for starters, right? Correct. 12 people can Capacity's be on the shuttle. 24 and so right. it'll be half capacity. And I'm, I'm excited, I'm excited to jump on the shuttle. We'll have to try it out, Liz. Yes. As we sit here in this beautiful setting, um, what would you like to share with the community on just um, just this efforts to really protect this preserve and the, um, all that goes into um, this nature preserve that's co-managed by the Land Conservancy? Oh, it's so proud of this. Obviously, there's so many aspects of RPV that we're proud of, but I would say the top of our list is our preserve. Mm -hmm. 1,400 acres, 33 miles of trails. As you mentioned, the partnership with the... Uh, Land Conservancy and the work that we do in partnership with them. And I'm so proud of the fact that in 2019, I was part of the Natural Communities Conservation Plan effort, which, uh, and the council of which was able to memorialize that NCCP, mm -hmm. uh, thus uh, memorializing uh, the protection of the uh, plant species and, and other life here in the preserve. The habitat is unbelievable. And I think it's interesting that within the 1,400 acres, there's actually what are 12 individual reserves. That's right. And I, did, I, didn't, I didn't realize that. Unique and interesting to, to find out that there's uh, also 21 or 20 other NCCPs throughout the state of California. Right. So that's a pretty small number when you think about it, the fact that we have this beautiful preserve and open space that's protected the way that it is yes. right here in our own city. Yes. Um, the city will be holding a quarterly meeting. Um, it's called for the Palos Verdes Nature Preserve Public Forum. It's April 14th. For the city that might want to join that Zoom meeting, really important every quarter um, to get the Zoom link, you can log on to the city's trails at rpvca.gov. And um, I'm just curious about these public forums, the, the input that you get, how that helps you, the council, make decisions about what happens with the nature preserve. Well, public input and public participation is essential to our existence as a city. As you, as you know, I mean, we are what we are because of the people's contribution. Mm -hmm. And this is just one of many ways that folks can get involved. But I actually, I think this is probably one of the the forums that people are generally less aware of. So mm -hmm. uh, certainly encourage people to go look it up and participate, provide your thoughts and comments as it relates to how we're managing the preserve. Well, as we move on to talk about the many other issues that are happening in the city mm -hmm. right now, any um, last um, bits of information you want to share with the community um, just about um, what's you know happening with efforts to again, um, protect this preserve and have it available to the community. Yeah, well, I'll highlight one final thing. As we already mentioned, the Land Conservancy is such a great partner to the city to mm -hmm. manage the preserve. And in this last year, they've done some recent work on Alta Vicente and Abalone Cove reserves related to revegetation. Uh, and so that's just one, of, one example of ongoing efforts that they help lead in our uh, preserve. Right. And also, I, I, I looked out in another note here about the fact that to emphasize that, you know, when you are coming out to use our beautiful preserve, there are rules and regulations in place. There's a there's a ranger hotline. In fact, we have a ranger here and uh, we have this four rangers full time in the city. Yes. And um, and they're working really hard. They deal with, you know, thousands of people, you know, weekly that come in and enter and um, the preserve or so. And, and if I can highlight that, Liz, I'm so proud of the ranger program that we have. Mm -hmm. So a year and a half ago, we decided that we did have deputies, our sheriff's deputies who were supporting the preserve along with their other duties. And we decided we wanted to have our own ranger program. So very yes. proud of the fact that our rangers are doing great work for uh, right. us in the city. So we have the four full timers. I know there's part timers and then we'll have parking ambassadors as well that will help with the parking here along Crenshaw. So um, all this so that we, the public can enjoy what, what's here. And um, again, I also want to, the trails at rpvca.gov is a great way to find out what's going on. Um, and remember, when you pack in, you take it out. That, right? That's right. I like that. There that's... you go. Um, let's move on to talk about city goals. Um, you had a workshop in February. Uh, and so give us an update on where you're at with setting the 21-22 city goals 
as I as I've said, that's one of my favorite forums. We get to look at our goals, think about the future, and uh, we have several categories: public safety, infrastructure, city lands, quality of life, government efficiency, and and um, and also citizen outreach as well. And there's all sorts of goals that are associated with those. And in fact, we had so many goals in the recent year, we decided let's take an opportunity to sort of consolidate. Mm -hmm. So we've dropped the number of goals we've had, but you know, really some of the um, major efforts that we see ourselves um, making progress on this year are still captured within those goals. So that'll come back to the council as part of the budget process okay. with the intent of uh, those goals certainly should be aligning with the dollars that we allocate to, to resource uh, all of those things. So that will come back. Uh, we have a budget form that's coming up Yes. just in one week on uh, March 30th. Right. And as part of that effort, um, we'll have three or four council meetings where we touch on the budget, propose budget, tighten it up. And then by June, it's generally our process to uh, approve our budget prior to the beginning of the new fiscal cycle, which starts on J July 1st. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at fiscally okay. Considering the pandemic, we've, our coffers, like everywhere, has taken a big hit. Um, so how is, is, is the budget shaping up okay since we've yes. mentioned yeah, that? Yes, shaping up. And we also, of course, are eagerly waiting for you know more clarity on the American Rescue Plan as approved mm -hmm. by President Biden on okay. March 11th. Yes. And um, we, we understand that there are dollars allocated through that rescue plan uh, for cities. So this is kind of an interesting time. I believe this is the first time in uh, our history that that's occurred. Money's passed through to the state onto the cities. We're, we're sort of getting clarity on what the expectations of those dollars right. are. Uh, but but we uh, certainly welcome uh, that additional a few infusion right. in light of the fact that we lost a little bit of our transit occupancy tax. But in spite of that, we're and regardless of that, we're still in great financial shape in this city. And with that, I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about the fact what we how the city has managed through this pandemic that is ongoing. The city hall has been reopened now. Um, and, you know, everybody's working really hard to uh, this. We are RPV together to get through this. Um, obviously, the effort now to get our community vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you want to share right now just about the recovery and the reopening of our city? Well, it's uh, it's a milestone time. This is actually just over one year since we all got that notice yes. and our lives were changed uh, in ways that we could never have anticipated back then. Obviously, the city's done a lot, uh, you know, as it pertains to supporting our seniors, our small businesses, uh, the students and the community, um, and taking steps to, to, to try to be a catalyst to reopen and recover. And, and luckily, we sit here today, one year later, vaccines are being distributed, um, and it's, it's a time of gradual reopening. Our schools are going to be reopening. Uh, mm -hmm. Elementary schools are underway, and our middle schools and high schools are, are coming. So a lot happening. Um, but I, on a very somber note, you know, within our own city, um, as of a couple of weeks ago, we, we have uh, had experienced, unfortunately, 53 deaths in our own, of our own citizens, of our residents, of those, our loved ones in our own city. So um, we, in a future council meeting, will mm -hmm. make sure we, we honor those um, and uh, take pause and, and celebrate their lives. Um, and certainly continue to work towards our reopening. Right. We definitely we send our sympathies and condolences to, to those families that have tragically lost lives. We know every one of us has felt this at, at some level. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and the city has really, I think our city has tried to be together, work together to be resilient and be there for each other. Um, and uh, again, you know, you can go on the city website and, and there is still the COVID page there that you can click on and find resources and ways to still, you know, get through it. And I don't know if you've been vaccinated yet. I can't I get registered. Shot. Yes. I got my good, first shot. Good. So as a healthcare professional and as the mayor of the city, I qualified as an emergency services right. uh, as well. So I did have my first one recently. My second one's coming up. The right. supply is improving and I see the numbers in our city have already gotten to the mid thirties. So about 35% or so of the residents of our city as well as the adjacent uh, peninsula cities are at a point where a good portion of their most high at risk residents have gotten vaccinated. So there's cause for celebration, but uh, we're not out of there yet. And yes, we need to and I know working. it's frustrating because I've been trying to book my own appointment and you go to vaccinatelacounty.com, my turn, uh, 
.ca.gov, so we'll put those up on the screen. Uh, and in, on the peninsula, there's Ralph's on Hawthorne, Rite Aid, and the Pavilions Pharmacy and RHE. So yes. I know the city was offering up locations, trying to, right, at yes. this point. is We're still looking for clarity on our uh, mobile that would program, be allowed. Which, yeah. which could work. Uh, but, okay. Uh, aside from that, we do have the three locations you mentioned. I actually happened to go to the forum, which was the best location where I had an appointment available. So uh, certainly if you go on, line it'll give you all your options locally that you can look at okay but i do have another question regarding finance um the finance director did present to the city council what was a cost of um, services study to consider adjustment fees and it was really interesting to watch that yes. conversation just about how fees happen in the city and what they pay for so um and there'll be a public hearing about this on april 20th so what would you want to inform residents about on this particular topic that came before the council on March 16th. Yes. Uh, well, I, I, I'm glad you were highlighting it. Yeah. Uh, it was a fee study. We looked at all of our city fees related to items, whether it's, you know, items initiated by personal choice or community benefit. Right. Uh, there's permits, for instance, that individuals will pursue that don't necessarily have that broader community benefits. So that's sort of the distinction we make. And we subsidize more heavily the those um, services that, that uh, we provide that have a bigger community benefit. Mm -hmm. um, well, we certainly realize it's been far too long since we've looked at this. Right, it's 2009, like 2009, yes. And there were some areas where uh, staff came back and our finance advisory committee came back with recommendations to increase and to decrease also. So we're kind of working through that. We made some comments, uh, the council did to staff and that will be coming back as you as you mentioned. So we, we always wanna make sure that um, in our minds we're appropriately priced in terms of the fees and we can uh, continue to provide our wonderful services to the city uh, in, in the fashion that we do. One of the biggest projects before the city right now, and I think we call them like the big five, we won't list them all, but, but is Ladera Linda. Um, and the proposed Ladera Linda Community Center um, park project um, has been going on for years. Um, and the city council at its March 16th meeting voted to appeal the planning commission's February 24th decision which was approving, amongst many things, a conditional use permit. Ex walk us through what the council's decision was, what it means. Sure. For all of those that have been following the Ladera Linda, waiting and wondering, when will there be a new center? <laughs> Absolutely, Liz. You, you acknowledged a long road to get to this point. Yes. Uh, the Planning Commission looked at the conditions uh, re recently and voted to approve the conditions as recommended by staff in the recent Planning Commission meeting. And as a member of the subcommittee, the Public Facility Subcommittee with Councilman Cruikshank, uh, Councilman Cruikshank and I decided to agendize uh, bringing this to council, having a discussion. And of course, as you mentioned, the council decided that we would in fact appeal the decision, not necessarily because of an agreement or disagreement with the decision that was rendered, uh, but more importantly, to ensure that the council is the final arbitrating body, if you will, uh, for all aspects of that project going forward. It's a it's a big project, there's the financing piece and other aspects of it. And uh, this just ensures that um, all future uh, efforts at the, at the count will occur at the council level. I mean, at this point, the city has spent, I think, was it close to a million dollars? Yeah, just for over 800,000. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and you know, for those that are watching and they don't may not even, they don't live near Ladera Linda, I don't expect you to walk us through the whole project by any means, but um, the, the whole idea is that that the facilities that are there um, are, are outdated, old, and so something needs to be done. It, for those that might think we don't want anything there, but just that's not going to happen. There will be something there eventually, a brand new center of some sort. Yes, yeah. or well, that's <laughs> maybe not. That, that's up Watch, to the, that's certainly up to the council. The council. <laughs> uh, but I would say um, certainly the council has all. I think all five members have publicly stated that. Uh, as you noted, the, the building there, which was a former elementary school, is severely dilapidated. It's, right. It actually has a great F, A through F. Um, so it's certainly due time for us to take action. Uh, we'll, we just have to define in that uh, meeting on April 6th exactly what that action will be. Right. We have a design in front of us, and um, we have a de novo hearing, which means that we can take new evidence and look at all aspects of that project and render our own independent decision on the 6th. Well. For our community watching, you should either log on to the city website um, on April 6th or, of course, watch RPB TV, um, and where the city council meetings, you can see them the first and uh, third Tuesday of every month. I'd love to move on to your mayor's honoree program oh, yes. that you have been building. Um, how is your honoree program going? Oh, it's and tell going us more great. about that. I 
just to seeing the response <laughs> from the community has just been uh, so delightful to me and the whole council. And in the last couple of meetings, we've recognized a few real special residents of our city. Mm -hmm. Jeremy Davies, Casa LA. This is a group that supports and advocates for children in LA County who've been removed their homes uh, due to abuse and neglect. Mm -hmm. uh, the work that he's done is amazing. Uh, so take a look, announcements have gone out. Mickey Jordan on Wayfinder Family Services. Um, she's done a lot of wonderful work around providing advocacy and services to individuals with disabilities. And also, of course, how can you not acknowledge the physicians uh, in light of what's happening around us and the mm -hmm. work that they typically do. Dr. Uh, Brad Chapel, uh, who's an attending physician at Harbor UCLA uh, in the emergency department. Uh, we recognized recently as well for all of his services as a frontline worker. Right. And so if anybody wants to nominate somebody for the honorary program, they just go on the city website. Is that right for that? Yes, or they can call and talk to the city mm -hmm. clerk um, either way. Great. And um, well, thank you for doing that. Um, Wheel of a day. I know last month you and I were did our brought our City Talk on the Road from the Point Vicente Interpretive Center back patio where we announced and confirmed Will of a Day luckily is not canceled this year like it was last year, but it will be virtual. Yes. April virtual. 10th. Fill us in. Lots of great things happening. Um, in fact, what I'm excited about is uh, two new exhibits are being de debuted during mm -hmm. uh, virtually, of course, uh, on April 10th. There's a puppet show for those of you who have kids. Uh, uh, look out for that and of course there's gonna be a virtual tour of the tidal pool a pool as well as the garden uh, okay. tour as well so lots of things happening related to whale of a day and you go on to whaleofaday.com and um that's where you'll get all the information um about all the different you'll be clicking on all these virtual events and i know that rpv tv our cameraman here carlos rivera and jeff they've been out filming um, with maria Sereo, my colleague for days to document all the great work that is not just done by you know the city staff, but of course Los Serenos to Point Vicente, the volunteer dosing group that helps run Whale of a Day and will help run Whale of a Day um, virtually. Yes. So um, I'm looking forward to it. I think even the kids can pick up whale hat kits. That's like one of my favorite activities. <laughs> I'm sure you've had a hat made for oh, you. I one have. or two with I, your I four children. I probably have worn one or two before, <laughs> I'm sure. Any extra mayor's announcements you always share? Um, you had anything you want to well, I touched on uh, this a little earlier, but just to repeat, I, I, again, I think this is a milestone moment for the county, the fact that we recently entered to the red tier. Yay! Word is that we're quickly progressing, case rates continue to decline, and uh, we are hopefully headed towards orange and, again, uh, incremental steps towards uh, reopening and, and the reestablishing of, of normal life, uh, which I know we're all looking forward to. So mm -hmm. uh, really, I just wanted to highlight that. And uh, also want to highlight our flock security program. So we still have uh, funds available for interested neighborhoods and HOAs that are looking to have a security camera subsidized by the city installed in their right. city. So uh, go online and take a look or reach out to the city to learn more. Right. The home security grant program, which is um, encouraging the installation of flock safety cameras, um, uh, the very first pilot program was done in Oceanfront Estates, not far from here, down at the bottom of Hawthorne Boulevard. And I had the opportunity to go talk to the neighbors to get feedback, because um, they were the pilot to encourage, and they're really encouraging HOAs. So let's just take a couple minutes before we wrap up and hear from some of the residents down at Oceanfront Estates about what they have to say about flock safety. Hi, I'm Lisa Levine, and I'm president of the Oceanfront Estates Homeowners Association. I have lived here for nine years, I've been president for five years, and right when I got to be on the board, I, I thought we needed some more safety. We, um, we implemented a neighborhood watch program, and we had a police detective come to the house along with a bunch of neighbors who said, safety in a neighborhood is like layers of an onion. You need to lock your doors and windows, get a big dog, lock your side gates, um, get an alarm and use it. So this is just another layer to the onion of keeping us all safe. This would stop a perpetrator at the main entrance before he maybe gets onto people's personal property. Um, the sheriffs can identify stolen vehicles, amber alerts, um, cars without license places, plates, and it goes directly to the sheriffs and they can act on it immediately. We've been very happy with the flock safety system. Um, it's a great license plate reader, very clear picture, and we feel so much safer since we installed it last summer. My name is Bob Chow. I've lived in the Oceanfront Estates neighborhood for about a year and a half, 
And I, I love the flock safety system. I have a quantitative background, so it comes with a lot of data that can be analyzed. And so from everything from security to understanding the number of people coming into the neighborhood, um, it's just, it's, 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 it provides just a wealth of data that's available to, any, to us to be able to analyze. My name's Larry Carapalotti. I'm a resident of Oceanfront Estates. Well, we were a pilot program, so once the city saw the value of this, they decided then to expand this uh, citywide. Sheriff's Department does have full-time access to the flock data, and they actually are the only ones that get the uh, reports when there's a, a stolen vehicle or if there's a suspicious vehicle or a vehicle that's on the hot list. Uh, in real time, the sheriff will get that notification so that they can dispatch someone out. We don't get that information here in Oceanfront Estates. I'm Mackenzie with the City of Rancho Palos Verdes, and we're so excited to be offering the Security Camera Grant Program again. HOAs and neighborhood groups can apply for reimbursements to help them purchase security cameras to monitor the neighborhood entrances and exits. And reimbursements are made for $1,000 per camera for up to two cameras per HOA or neighborhood group. Once we heard about the grant program with the city, we thought, why not? I think it's an excellent deterrence. Uh, just having those signs at the entrances that say, at both entrances we have signs that say, all entrances and exits from this community are recorded for use by law enforcement. So 80% of it, according to the police, is a deterrent, and that makes us all feel safer. Now, if somebody does get into the community and commits a crime, we've got their license plate, we've got the car description, um, everything that the police could need to be able to catch the perpetrators. You could go to our city's website if you're interested in signing up and finding out more. It's rpvca.gov slash flock. So there you go on that. Um, well, all good things have to come to an end, and I think uh, we need to wrap it up here. So anything you want to share with the community, final thoughts on just the efforts that have gone into this Del Cerro Park neighborhood um, to balance quality of life for this beautiful area, as well as, as we see people walking in, making sure that there's plenty of access for people to come into the Palos Verdes Nature Preserve. Uh, well, I wanted to speak thank you from, from myself and the council to all the people from the community who have spoken up during this whole period of receiving public input. Mm -hmm. I really do believe, you know, it's hard to get a perfect solution, um, but I do believe that this is an example of where we collaborated really, really well with uh, the city around us, with people outside the city who like to, to look at and, uh, and visit the preserve. And I'm optimistic that the outcome will be a very positive one in terms of, again, striking that right balance for this area as far as public access and, and keeping this na uh, neighborhood tranquil and peaceful mm -hmm. for the neighbors as well. So. And it doesn't get any better than this time of the year, right, with spring and, and nature full well, blooming. Let's look at this day. It has been incredible. Um, well, with that, thank you, Mary Alegria, for taking the show on the road. I will be meeting you in a month from now. And we're going to be at Ladera Linda in a month from now, so um, to uh, bring from that community. And I think this is the one show I can end by telling the mayor, I think it's time for us to take a hike. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Go. And thank you again for watching RPV City Talk. I'm Liz Brown Swanson with Mayor Alegria. Have a great day out there. See you next time.